Good afternoon and welcome to We Are One, the first in a new series, a live series, offered by Regional One Health Foundation. Our topic today is COVID-19. Our goal is to provide each of you with factual information from topic experts to help you stay healthy and safe during the holiday season and the winter. My name is Tammy Ritchie. I am your moderator for the day. I am the Chief Development Officer for Regional One Health, and I have the privilege of leading Regional One Health Foundation. What I am not is a professional moderator, so you will see me use my notes during the session today. I would like to take this time now to introduce you to these wonderful people I work with, our physician leaders who are joining us today. I will start with Dr. Amber Thacker, who joins us from her office at Regional One Health. Hi, Dr. Thacker, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing very well. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Amber Thacker is the supreme hospitalist. I want to make sure your peers hear me say that. She's actually the medical director for hospital medicine and a full-time academic hospitalist and a part-time academic newborn attending at Regional One Health, and we're very fortunate to have her. Dr. Thacker obtained her doctor of medicine from the University of South Alabama and completed a combined residency in internal medicine and pediatrics. Her academic research right now is mostly focused on COVID-19. She is the co-principal investigator of the Regeneron trial, and she is a sub-investigator on a vaccine trial. In her spare time to relax, she likes to play guitar and sing with her family. I wish we were giving her more free time, but we're not right now. I would like to introduce next Dr. Cyrilyn Walters. Hi, everyone. Hi, Dr. Walters. How are you? She joins us from her office also. How are you today? I'm doing well. Good. Dr. Walters uh, works for the University of Tennessee, where she trained as an assistant professor, and she is the medical director of ambulatory services at Regional One Health. She has a master's of public health with a concentration in maternal and child health. She received her doctor of medicine from the University of Minnesota, and then she came down here to work in her combined residency of internal medicine and pediatrics with the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. We are thrilled to have her as a member of our team. In her other life, again, I don't know how she has another life right now outside of Regional One Health. She enjoys her creative and entrepreneurial talents. She is a part owner of an event planning company. Her secret talent is she can walk on stilts <laughs> and she plays the steel drum. Welcome, Dr. Walters. It's nice to have you today. Thank you. And last but never least is my favorite boss, our president and CEO, Regional One Health, Dr. Reginald Coopwood. Dr. Coopwood has been the CEO and president since March 2010. Prior to joining Regional One Health, Dr. Coopwood served as the Associate Clinical Professor of Surgery at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He was the Associate Professor of Surgery at Meharry Medical College, and he served as CMO and CEO at other hospital systems. He has told me he cannot play any instrument, and he is not going to sing. So I have my dreams of having a band have been dashed by Dr. Coopwood today. Welcome, Dr. Coopwood, nice to see you. You are in a separate room, safe from everybody as well. Hello, everyone. So I'd like to welcome all of you again who are joining us. To start the discussion today, I'm going to ask each of our doctors a series of questions. Um, I'm gonna ask them to start with what they're seeing in their day-to-day -day lives from their respective seats within the healthcare system. Then we will go to specific questions that we collected from a broad array of community members. They will answer those. If we have time at the end, we will spend some time doing some live Q&A. And I also wanna let you know that throughout today's segment, we will run a text to give option across the screen. So if at any point during today's discussion, 
you feel compelled to support the work of our physicians and frontline staff, please use the text to give option and make a gift. All right, I am not gonna waffle about. I'm going to jump straight into questions. I'm going to start with Dr. Coopwood. Dr. Coopwood, would you please share with everyone the current state of COVID-19 in Shelby County and here at Regional One Health? Thank you, I'd be more than happy to. Um, today, which is November 18th, we had 192 um, positive cases. Um, yesterday, Tuesday, which is kind of an average from the weekend, we had 100, 835 cases. Unfortunately, we've had a, four additional deaths over this past um, 24 hours. Our current ICU capacity is about 89%, um, with 28% of those being filled with um, patients either COVID positive or COVID suspected. Our um, acute beds are about 91% um, filled throughout the, we're talking about throughout the city and all hospital systems. And so we are at a point that we can manage at this level, but if we have much more positivity and, and people becoming more acutely ill, it will continue to stress the system. In Shelby County, we had um, a total of about 43,640 total cases. We've had 617 individuals within Shelby County that have passed due to this, um, this virus. Across the state, we've had 318, um, almost 319 total positive cases throughout the state of Tennessee, and we've lost 1,810 patients. Um, these are concerning numbers. They continue to grow and um, something that we all should be very aware of as we um, go through the holiday seasons moving forward. So Dr. Coopwood, would you say that we are entering or are currently in a spike similar to what Europe is experiencing right now? I think we're, we're into a um, same similar spike that we're seeing in Europe. Um, as these numbers continue to grow up, this was projected when we had the flu season and combination of an uncontrolled um, coronavirus outbreaks. So we, we are in a very concerning time. Um, if we are not able to flatten the curve, we will probably overrun our systems um, here locally as, as we've seen in some states um, across our country. Thank you. Dr. Thacker, I'd like to switch to you for a minute. You run our COVID units and in our inpatient side of the hospital. I'd like to know, what do you see on a day-to-day -day basis? What are you and your team dealing with and, and focusing on every day? So as Dr. Coopwood was saying, from an inpatient perspective, hospitalizations are increasing, but right now still still manageable. Um, hopefully it stays that way. Um, patients here are typically hospitalized if they require oxygen or have evidence of kidney injury or other organ damage from the virus. Um, the length of stay really varies by patient. For most patients, it's at least five days. And for some, it's as long as months. Um, I think from a team standpoint, in the beginning, there was a lot of fear and there still is. But I think it's become a lot more manageable. We've adapted and come very come more confident in being able to reassure our patients. Um, I know myself. I we're in their room and we're wearing PPE and they can't see our faces and you know all they see are our eyes and you know a, otherwise a big gown coming at them. So mm -hmm. I, I stand outside the patients' rooms a few times a day, pull my mask down so they can see a friendly face and a smile. Um, our hospitals provided iPads so our patients can communicate with their families via FaceTime. They also IT put games on them to help them sort of take their, their mind off of what's happening. And I think having a team that's confident and smiling and reassuring is, is huge compared to how it was you know, in the beginning. Um, for me, the biggest change we've had so far is that we didn't have treatments available. I've never been in a situation before where we had so many patients that we were only really able to offer comfort care to. And now we have treatments that are actually working and helping our patients. Um, we have a long way to go, but it's really reassuring to know we have a lot, a lot of new treatments coming down the pipeline. I think it's very interesting. One of the things you mentioned, I don't think the average person knows is that if you are a COVID patient and you're in the unit, you don't have visitors. Is that correct? 
That is correct. And our visitors are limited in the rest of the hospital to some degree. And that varies. We, you know, we have to change those um, rules as our patient numbers increase and as the prevalence of infection in the community increases. So we do have limitations when patients are um, end of life care. We do make an effort to bring family members in and have them be with their with their family member, their loved one. But um, it is very limited. So having iPads and the ability to FaceTime and make phone calls and it's a lot of it's a it's a much more difficult effort and it's not ideal, but it is we've adapted to it. Thank you. And Dr. Walters, the same question, although you are on the outpatient side of Regional One Health, what are you seeing come in on a day to day basis in the ambulatory clinic? So, yes, yeah, so we actually have a COVID follow up clinic in our outpatient center. And so we're seeing the patients that either have left the hospital and are following up, whether they're, they left and they were still on oxygen and not um, totally improved. But the biggest bulk of our patients are the ones that didn't get hospitalized. These are the patients that you don't hear too much about in the news. Um, they, they got diagnosed, they, they've dealt with the virus at home, and a lot of them still have lingering cis, um, symptoms. These are what we will call the mild to moderate uh, patients with COVID-19. So that's a large bulk of, of what we see in the clinic. Um, there's also a lot of um, patients that come in and have um, just some confusion on what needs to be done in terms of do they need another test. They might have their job saying they have to have a negative test before they um, return to work, which is not the recommendation. So we spend time educating them on um, when you need to retest and even sending that education to their um, jobs as well. Um, and finally, just so many people are still not aware of kind of what needs to be done. So you'll have people say, well, I test negative last week, even though I'm having symptoms this week, I can't have COVID. And you can have a negative test and have COVID three days after. So just a lot of education and just kind of help in support the patients that um, have COVID and are not in the hospital. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm going to jump into our prevention segment. And I'm going to start with Dr. Thacker. Dr. Thacker, if you wouldn't mind, please share with us what is the most current information on how the virus spreads and best practices to reduce the spread. So we know the primary mechanism of spread is via what's called droplet transmission. And maybe under the right circumstances, there may be some airborne transmission. What this means is that if a patient is that has COVID, so anybody, any, anyone who has COVID, if they're breathing, talking, singing, coughing, any of those things, and we all breathe and cough if we have, especially if we're sick, um, they produce little tiny droplets that can carry the virus. And then those droplets can travel through the air and land on someone else who's not already infected. To the, it can land in their eyes, their nose, their mouth. Um, that's the primary mechanism. Now, it also, those droplets can land on surfaces. And if someone who's not infected touches a surface that is contaminated with those infected droplets and then touches their own eyes, mouth, nose, they may, may become ill that way. That's not the primary mechanism, but that is probably at least partially contributing. So the way to prevent those things is for us to wear masks, to keep a social distance so that we are not in contact with those droplets before they land somewhere and then wash your hands frequently. All right, a big question I have Dr. Thacker is what does close contact mean? So close contact in the context of COVID means to be within six feet of someone or less for more than about 15 minutes. So if you, um, if you're around somebody in your household contact or a close friend and you're within that, that distance of the person, then that would mean that's a close contact. It's not the only way to catch COVID. You can have a, a shorter duration or um, be closer with or without a mask, but wearing a mask and social distancing reduces both the risk of contact with droplets and reduces what would be considered a close contact. If you're in public and in public, we're not distancing and wearing masks and we're around a crowd of people for more than 15 minutes, that's that's a close contact. And a crowd of people or even around one person you don't know who may have it. Yes. Correct. Thank you.
Right, I'm going to switch now to Dr. Walters, if you don't mind. Dr. Walters, with the holidays approaching, what can we do to remain safe? We got a lot of questions about when we get together with our family members and we can't go outdoors. Let's say it's the dead of winter in Iowa. I can't go outside. I've got my family there. What do you recommend? Should we all get tested before we get together? Is that a waste of resources? Do I need to wear a mask around my family when I'm inside? Could you please give a little information to help us with that? So honestly, the biggest recommendation is that this holiday season, you, do, you don't get together. Um, the only way to really reduce the risk of transmission with your get togethers would be if everyone who was getting together quarantined for 10 to 14 days prior to the holiday um, get togethers. So that would have required you already because the holidays are next week already to be at home, not exposed to anyone else outside the family who is part of that group. Um, beyond that, um, again, you have to modify your risk. Um, if you have someone who's at a higher risk of, of catching COVID, then using your, your um, online resources, your virtual Thanksgivings would be the best for those. Um, if it's a younger person, you might be able to say, hey, after seven days, if you're not having symptoms to 10 days, that may be conceivably, but definitely wearing masks indoors because it's it's the close contact is 15 minutes, but it's a cumulative 15 minutes is what they're recommended. So you might have 10 minutes with someone who was positive in the morning and five minutes with someone in the afternoon and it still puts you at risk. So as much as possible, wearing masks indoors and keeping that social distance as you can. In terms of the testing, like I spoke about a little before, you can have a negative test today and three days later still be COVID positive. And that's because before you have symptoms, the viral load and the amount of virus in your body doesn't build up enough where that test becomes positive. Usually around when you develop symptoms, when your viral load is getting at its highest is when you may have a positive test and you can you can have those tests. So testing multiple times before, testing right after is not going to really change the transmission. And you may have a false sense of security if you have a negative test, but was in fact um, exposed the day before you got that test. Oh, thank you. I want to continue with you if you don't mind. Let's say someone in my household is COVID positive and they have the virus. How can I prevent from getting COVID? Oh, if it is an individual adult in your household, then the best is for that person to quarantine and not only quarantine from the outside, um, exposures, but quarantine within the family as well, meaning that person should be in one area of the house if, if that's available, or at least um, in a bedroom by themselves. Um, definitely uh, avoid using things together, so not congregating in the kitchen or living spaces. If that person is able to have their own bathroom, do that. Um, save for that, making sure that whatever utensils are used in the kitchen is only used by that person who is positive, as well as linens and washings. You want to cut those down. So you don't want to have their linens and their clothing in the laundry every day. You, if you can, try to keep it to that week and so that you're reducing your exposure. When, if you have to be around that person, wearing a mask, um, making sure you wash your hands very frequently and and keep as much distance as you can. Obviously, if it's a younger person that is being cared by you, it's hard to do that. Mm -hmm. So being as as much as you can, washing hands, wearing masks and making sure that you limit your exposure to that person. Let's say I do everything I'm supposed to do. Let's say that I have worn my mask, I social distance, I work remotely maybe even, and I do everything I can to keep myself healthy. Are there other things I can do, Dr. Walters, to make sure I stay healthy during the winter months? Is it eating right, exercising, drinking so much water, vitamin C, zinc? What can I do to make sure I stay healthy? So 
just kind of the recommendations that you, we've had over time. You want to make sure you keep active in the, around the winter time. Forget viruses. We also have the winter blues because it's darker. Um, you don't get out as much, and so overall, you're you're kind of stuck inside the house. So being able to still try to go go outside and be as active as possible, making sure that you take care of your mental health. So interacting with people, whether it's virtually or or at a distance, making sure that you have that connection, um, making sure you drink a lot of fluids. There's no evidence that anything like using mouthwash or drinking very hot liquids, none of those things are going to reduce your risk of actually catching um, COVID um, coronavirus. Um, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin and zinc, those are all vitamins and minerals that we use to help um, heal our immune system or heal our bodies when we're sick. So they're they're very good recommendations, and we actually recommend them for patients who do have COVID. Um, they they don't harm, and so they they can definitely help. So just overall kind of well being is what we recommend, and as much as possible social distance and wear your mask. Dr. Walters, would you please share with us why this virus is impacting more people of color? Okay. And so initially when it came out that, you know, we had that um, unequal distribution of COVID happening, um, the thought was that maybe it was genetics or maybe it had something to do with, with being a person of color. However, the same reason why there's inequality in healthcare is the same reason why COVID is, is un, unequivocally um, affecting people of color. And it's more to do with socioeconomic status. So you have um, persons of color are more likely not able to work from home because they have entry level jobs. They're working in areas where they aren't able to social distance. If they're more people of color live in poverty, if you live in poverty, you tend to have more family members in a smaller area. So you're unable to social distance if someone was to, to be sick. And in addition to that, because of the inequalities of health, um, you have um, patients that are less willing to come to the hospital when they're they come when they're sicker, and you also have more of the health problems that we know put you at risk. Um, having having those in the, that population, so your hypertension, your kidney diseases, your um, diabetes, your lung disorder, your obesity, those are the things that you see unequally in that um, group of people. Now, Dr. Walters, I'd like to ask a couple of questions around treatment. Let's say I do my COVID test, I test positive. When should I go to the hospital? So right now you want to try to avoid the hospital if you don't need it. And like Dr. Cooper would talk about, you know, our bed situation, you wanna make sure that we have those beds available for severe. So what you want to look for is evidence of severe disease. The first thing, if someone's diagnosed with COVID, we recommend if you're able to, to get one of those finger pulse oximeters that kind of checks your oxygen level. Um, that can get you to the hospital earlier because sometimes your oxygen level drops before you actually feel symptoms. And the earlier you get to the hospital, the better your chances are of overcoming. So low oxygen level is one of the major indications. If you're having severe chest pain or shortness of breath and unable um, to breathe or even move around, those would be other indications at that time. Um, if you don't have any of those though, you want to keep in close contact with your provider um, and so that they can monitor your symptoms throughout that disease, even if you're not hospitalized. Okay, let's say I am at home quarantining, I have COVID. What should I do while quarantining? Is there any kind of treatment I should be administering to myself? So as of now, if you're at home, the basic treatments are just supportive. And what that means is if you're having fever and chills, you take acetaminophen or Tylenol, ibuprofen or Aleve. Um, if you're having a cough, you can try kind of over-the-counter cough medicines to try and help um, modify that cough. Um, your vitamins, like we talked about, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, 
as a supplement. And for some people, they, they develop diarrhea during COVID. So making sure that you're drinking plenty of fluids um, with the loss of smell and taste with uh, some, they're not able to eat or don't, don't have that appetite, but making sure that you're, you're keeping those fluids up so that you don't get dehydrated and require hospitalization as a result. Thank you. Dr. Thacker, if uh, I could ask you a couple of questions around treatment. It's being said that Memphis has access to the same experimental drugs that were used for the president. If I have COVID, how do I access these resources? So my understanding of President Trump's care was that he received really the same standard care we offer our patients currently and then also an experimental treatment. So he was given remdesivir, which is an antiviral medication that has emergency approval from the FDA, and which we offer our patients when they're admitted. Um, it's an IV medication, so it's really reserved for patients who are in the hospital. Um, another treatment that he received and that we offer is convalescent plasma, which is blood plants plasma that is collected from donors, um, just like any other blood donation. Um, they're donors who have recovered from COVID, and the goal of that is to have their anti-COVID antibodies help the recipient fight the infection. So basically it just takes the liquid portion of the blood which contains the antibodies and those are given to the recipient. Um, another treatment we have are steroids or specifically dexamethasone, which is a, a drug we've had a long time, but we found it to be effective in some cases helping patients recover from COVID. So we offer all of those treatments to our inpatients and then the experimental treatment that he received is currently available to our patients as part of a study. And it's a drug from a company called Regeneron. It's a pair of antibodies against the spike protein on the coronavirus. It's currently available um, as part of an outpatient study here, which I'm the co-principal investigator for. And to, it's available to patients who are, who are COVID positive or to people who are close contacts or household contacts of people who have COVID as a means to see if it works as a preventive medication. Um, we're excited to offer this to our patients here. We're the, we were the only site in Tennessee for it. I do believe they uh, are trying to get a site up on the other side of the state in Chattanooga, but for now, I think we're the only active site. Um, we're really grateful to Regional One and UT for helping us make that happen. And if anyone here watching today is COVID positive or has is a household contact of someone who is, they can go to the cleanlife.com forward slash COVID website, which I think the address is going to appear on the screen. Um, and they'll answer a few questions and it'll help them determine whether or not they might be eligible to participate in that trial. Okay, thank you. We do have somebody very important watching right now, Dr. Thacker, your four-year-old son just logged in on our chat. <laughs> How sweet. I think you think. All right, Dr. Thacker. I, yeah, that's mommy. I'm going to get back to treatment. I do have another question because we've had, you know, more and more people in the community who have had COVID or they have close family members and friends that have had COVID. So I'm wondering how these individuals should be thinking about their immunity period and the potential for reinfection. Is it even possible for an individual to contract COVID twice or more times in a year? That's a very good question. Um, I spoke earlier about convalescent plasma and how we take antibodies from patients who have recovered from COVID and who are gracious enough to donate their plasma and use that to try to help people who are currently infected. So far, what we do know are that those patients re who recover from COVID maintain a relatively high amount of antibodies against the virus in their bloodstream for about three months. And then after that time, it appears that they decline. We're not really sure what that means, but our assumption is that they may lose some of that immunity over time. The CDC updated their quarantine guidelines based on those findings. Um, we do think some patients, we think most patients have some protection from reinfection for about three months. So if a recovered patient is re-exposed to COVID during that three month period, they do not need to quarantine but after that three month period, if they're exposed, you know, after they've been well for three months, we recommend they quarantine for 14 days, just like patients who've never been infected. We do know that some patients do become reinfected and really as with many other common viruses, but this isn't thought at this time to be a routine occurrence, but time will really tell. It's hard to say this early. 
Okay, thank you. Dr. Walters, since you run our follow-up COVID clinic, can you tell me what, if any, health issues may persist or arise after I recovered from COVID-19? So there are some things that um, research has been showing and I've seen in the clinic and some of the most common um, disorders that people have post COVID would be prolonged fatigue and shortness of breath with activity. Um, some of the other common but not as common would be people um, reporting increasing anxiety, depression, insomnia, and what many people just call a mental fogginess is what they would describe it as. Um, and then even less likely, there have been people who've had prolonged diarrhea, meaning for maybe about two weeks or three weeks after their diagnosis. But some of the symptoms have been persistent for one, two, I've even seen people three months after their diagnosis that are still struggling with some of these um, symptoms. Wow. That's a, that's a long time. I'd like to shift, if I can, kind of shift everybody to talk about vaccines now and, and beyond. Dr. Thacker, since you are so heavily involved in the research, I'd like to ask you, how does the Regeneron cocktail differ from other COVID treatments and how is it similar? So Regeneron is not an antiviral like remdesivir, but it's more similar to convalescent plasma in that it's a pair of monoclonal antibodies. They attach to do two different sites on the spike protein, which is a protein that the virus needs to enter human cells. So by attaching to it, they block its ability to enter cells, which blocks its ability to cause infection, and it blocks its ability to multiply because it has to use machinery from our own cells to multiply. Um, this is similar to convalescent plasma and that we're using antibodies. The benefit to it is that we have control over what the antibodies are and we can have the, the two if we've, they've been shown to be effective in labs and we can, they're in high concentrations. So in that drug, we have the ability to control that we have effective, very effective, the most effective antibodies and have them in intentionally high concentrations. someone is thinking right now, is the vaccine going to be safe, especially since maybe the trials are, are expedited and there may not be just thousands and thousands of people involved in the clinical trials? So there are multiple vaccines right now, really in various stages of clinical trials. Um, while a lot of manpower is being put into moving them along as quickly as possible, they're still being tested on the usual large numbers of patients for safety and efficacy. Um, after vaccines um, and really any medication, including medications like the Regeneron antibody cocktail are approved and the trials are over, we have, we'll have ongoing monitoring and reporting of adverse um, reactions. There's never a way to be 100% sure that there won't be some rare adverse reactions but I wouldn't expect these vaccines to be any less safe than any other vaccines, and we'll be monitoring them in the same way. In medicine, we always think about risk versus benefit whenever we make treatment decisions. In the case of a vac COVID vaccine and with any other treatment, there's always going to be some possible risk, even if it's low. On the flip side, with COVID, we know for certain that it's very risky and to gain immunity by infection carries the risk of death. So for my own family, for myself, for my patients, I would recommend they um, tolerate the possible but very small risk with a vaccine um, because the benefit of preventing infection really far outweighs that risk. Thank you. When do you realistically think that Memphis would get a vaccine and do you know what the logistical distribution plan is going to be? I hope very soon. We may start to see the beginning of vaccinations in the next month or so. Um, there's multiple vaccines, as I mentioned, and they're in various stages of trials and there's some logistical um, issues with how to store and how to distribute those. Um, but I would expect that as, as these trials reach the required numbers of enrolled patients um, without serious issues that we would expect some approval pretty quickly. As far as distribution, the federal and state governments are establishing um, the distribution of them for Tennessee. You can read about the plan for Tennessee at the Tennessee Health Department's um, website, which I believe is gonna be listed at the bottom of the screen as well. 
Um, it's a long document, but they've given a really nice summary at the website and described how they plan to roll out vaccinations, starting with first line healthcare workers and first responders. Um, each state will be directing the distribution, but it will be under oversight and guidelines that are coming from the federal government. Thank you. And I will let our viewers know we are actually going to include links to those websites under in the comment section underneath the YouTube video. So that's at 10.gov and that is uh, under the vaccine segment of the Tennessee.gov health department. Dr. Kupwid, are you still with us? Hello. <laughs> I'm here learning with everyone else. Are learning, are you taking notes? Good. <laughs> so Dr. Kupwid, what persons or governing body are going to decide who gets the COVID vaccine? Well, uh, similar to what um, Dr. Thacker just mentioned, the, you know, the distribution plan will come from um, the federal government. They'll be distributed to the states. The states will have a distribution plan um, like the one that was referenced for the state of Tennessee. As it stands, we'll be distributing these through hospitals and healthcare systems. It sounds like the vaccine that Tennessee may be getting is the one that needs the minus 70 degree freezer. Um, and so for our organization, we are preparing for that. We're, we're getting um, those freezers available to store the vaccine so that we can put our, together our distribution plan within our system um, and then ultimately the community. Okay, thank you. I do have a final question for all of you before we go to some live Q&A. And I will start with Dr. Thacker. Looking back on the past nine months and the country and regional one health's response to the COVID crisis, what do you think we did well and what would you do differently if you had the opportunity? Um, I think we did a great job mobilizing resources while at the same time providing an atmosphere of calm and reassurance for our patients and for staff. The hospital administration worked really hard to get us the PPE and other equipment that we needed. I personally teach residents and they train at many different locations and they've given us really great feedback on how much more organized and prepared than we, than we were than their other work sites, which was a huge compliment. Um, I genuinely can't think of anything that I would do differently, but as we're becoming more comfortable with masking and starting to let our guard down, we tend to stop being as diligent as we once were. I think we can always put more emphasis on correct use of PPE, mask wearing, and social distancing. Thank you. Dr. Walters, the same question. Looking back over the last nine months, what do you think we did well? And, and if you had the opportunity, what would you do differently? I think one of the things we did really well, and especially here in the Memphis area, is that all the expertise kind of came together, even the hospital systems where traditionally you might see, see some competition. Everyone kind of put all of those things aside and worked together to come up with a strategic plan on how to um, address this virus. Um, the one thing that I, I in hindsight, think that we could have done better is have that much effort and strategic on the education aspect to the community. Um, by time we we kind of were on one front and had that education aspect, we were behind the eight ball trying to fight a lot of misinformation um, that was out there um, for our patients overall. Okay. Dr. Coopwood, same question to you. What would you do differently? What do you think we did well? well I think what we did well is we faced the unknown together um, where you saw the clinical staff, the physicians and nurses were kind of thrust into this environment. We didn't really, we don't, we didn't really have any history with it. So we learned from what we saw was happening in, in New York when we first had our first surge in, in July and August. And, and I think that's the important thing that how, how all the clinical staff work together um, to, to try to, to make it better. I, I think, you know, I, I think that I don't, can't look back and say we should have done something different because we were dealing with the unknown. As, as it has moved across the country, as we've, more information has come on board, more therapeutics have come on board. Um, it's imperative that we continue to learn on this and continue to find the best treatments and op options for our patients. Um, so I don't, I don't think we, 
we felt, I think that as was stated, um, as this drags on, we're getting much more lax um, in our mask wearing. But I think this this spike hopefully gets everyone's attention in Memphis and Shelby County, as well as across the state and the country, that we're still dealing with a serious virus. Thank you. I liked this question so much that I decided I was going to answer it myself. So I want to say one of the things I think we did exceptionally well was call on our donors immediately and get private gift support. I have to say they came through for our team. We had to mobilize and buy equipment so fast for this beautiful group of men and women you see on the screen right now. We had literally days. But because of people like the Keenies and the Hess family, the Assisi Foundation, Reventix, and so many other groups of people, we were able to get ventilators, PPE, monitors, and all of the things that are needed. I mean, just look at this respiratory therapist. This is what her day is like with each patient. That is a lot of PPE that we had not budgeted. So our donors came through in a big way for us. Right now, one of the things that we're really working on is keeping our teams mentally and emotionally safe and healthy. So if you feel compelled to give today, I can tell you that money is used immediately and it goes to help continue to keep our, our patients and our, our staff safe, but it also goes to things like parent support groups, expanding mental health access for our team members, even grief support groups. Those are things that we've had to start up here at the hospital, and that means the world to us. So I think, I just have to say, our donors did a wonderful job. So again, there is a text to give option. If you want to be a monthly donor or want to make a one-time gift, this team is here every day doing a yeoman's task. Um, it has been very difficult, but they have risen to the occasion. And I want to thank all those that have contributed and ask the rest of you to please consider making a gift. We do have a question that came in for our live Q&A. So I had it sent to me and I'm gonna ask this now. I think this is for Dr. Thacker. The question is, once a vaccine is available, is there a waiting period after getting the vaccine before it's effective? That would depend on the vaccine and there should be data from trials that they're, they're testing. So when they give a vaccine in a trial, they test patients for some follow-up period and look for antibody production and then test to see how long those antibodies stick around. It takes a little time to develop immunity with most vaccines. I would expect these vaccines to be very similar. Um, typically we tell patients for the flu vaccine and other similar vaccines that it's about a two week period. So certainly I would not get the vaccine and run out that day and say, I don't need any more social distancing and masking. And then also the other thing that applies to this vaccine, just like any other vaccine, is that it may not provide a hundred percent protection, but it hopefully the goal, the goal of it is to reduce the spread and to reduce mortality. So we want people to have a better chance of fighting it off and having their own antibodies to it will help that. So it, it does take some time and it, without, it will take a long time for us to have that data. Okay, thank you. We had another one come in and I'm going to shoot this over to Dr. Walters. Dr. Walters, what do you say to young, healthy people who perhaps don't feel that COVID really affects them and who subsequently don't take social distancing and other measures seriously? So for those um, younger people and, and people overall is it may not affect you individually, but it will affect you. Dependent, seeing the numbers of cases that we're having and the rise in the cases this winter, it, it's going to be hard that you're not gonna end up knowing someone that was gravely affected by this. That person may not have died, but it may be someone that you know was a breadwinner in the house and for the next six months, you're struggling because you're unable to make ends meet because that person can't work anymore. So it may not affect you individually, but it will affect you eventually. Wow, thank you. All right, and the last question I have is, I'm gonna ask all of you, I'll start with Dr. Thacker. What do you say to people who think the response to COVID-19 is overblown? 
I would say to anyone who feels that way, that COVID is very serious. It's really unlike anything I've ever seen. Um, I walk across that front line with my team every day and we witness what it does to patients. Young and old patients become very sick and they die in some cases. Um, those who do survive are often unwell for months and months, going home with oxygen even. Um, and some may have long-term permanent damage to their lungs and other organs. Some are awaiting transplants. I've mm -hmm. been the last face that several patients have seen, and I don't want to be the last face anyone else sees. So I would say to that person that you please help us help you by following, taking it seriously, following the guidelines and wearing a mask. Thank you. Dr. Walters, what do you say to people who think that the response to COVID-19 is overblown? I'm kind of similar to my previous answer. Um, some people have gotten COVID and did very well and or have had people who've reported that they did very well. So they think, hey, this is nothing. And then we have conflicting reports on, you know, the death rate, how how deadly it is. But one of the things you don't recognize is those are polar opposites. And we have a lot of people who are sick and struggling with COVID in the middle. And this is essentially like playing Russian roulette. And you might have one bullet that kills you, but there are probably two or three other bullets in that chamber that can maim you pretty badly. So um, you may not see it individually, but that doesn't mean that it's not serious. And there, there are a lot of people who it's very serious for. Wow. Dr. Coopwood, what is your response to people who think that COVID-19 is overblown? Well, in these seven or so months that we've um, been dealing with this novel virus, close to 250,000 people in our country alone have died. And if you don't consider this to be serious, you know, talk to those families. They've lost loved ones. There's people who aren't there anymore who probably otherwise would have still been at home, um, but for this virus. So um, it is real. Um, it is, death is real and we need to take it very seriously until we have this thing under control. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of you who joined us today. I'd like to thank my wonderful physicians, Dr. Coopwood, Dr. Thacker, Dr. Walters. I'd like to thank the team behind the scenes uh, with Forever Ready Production. And I'd like to thank all of you who have made donations during this. This video will be up immediately on our YouTube channel for Regional One Health. So you feel free to share it or to watch it, push the button and like it. Um, I want to thank all of you again. And I also want to wish you all a safe, socially distant holiday. And thank you for tuning in today to We Are One. Regional One Health is going to great lengths so you can receive exceptional medical care without increasing your risk of exposure to COVID-19. So if you need to see your provider in person, you'll get the same level of care. And whenever we can, we're using technology to create a contact-free patient experience. And that even includes a new curbside pharmacy service. We are confident we can provide exceptional care in a safe environment because at Regional One Health, your life is our passion.